Welcome to uh, Grand Junction and a beautiful uh, fall sunny day here and uh, welcome to the seminar sponsored by the Colorado River District. I'm Tom Sharp, I'm president of the District uh, Board of Directors and uh, we're delighted that you all are here. We have a full day uh, schedule of, uh, of uh, speeches and panels and opportunities to uh, ask questions. Uh, we wanted to be sure we adequately covered the, the field of, of uh, importance today and so we entitle the seminar The Future, Past and Present, <coughs> which certainly is broad enough to cover just about everything that we're going to be doing and all the questions that you may ask. I want to uh, uh, commend the uh, district in its 75th year of existence. This is our anniversary year and we uh, have had a number of programs all year long in commemoration of that uh, long history that the district has had. We have had uh, uh, joint meetings with uh, some other entities that uh, in the state that have also uh, had their anniversary year. The Colorado Water Conservation Board uh, is equally uh, aged and celebrating its 75th year as is the uh, Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. But we're, we're particularly proud of the 75 years of uh, protecting and enhancing the uh, water uh, interests of Western Colorado. And we will have near the end of the program, as you know from your, uh, reading the program, uh, an opportunity to have a conversation uh, with the author of a book we uh, uh, asked to be written by George Sibley uh, on the 75 year history of the River District. And you'll have a, an opportunity to uh, subscribe to uh, that book. I wanna, I wanna take a couple minutes to recognize uh, some people. First of all, we have um, our general manager, Eric uh, Kuhn here, and uh, he's going to be on the opening panel. And we also have a number of staffers that are here. I would like to uh, ask all the staff members of the River District to stand briefly so we could recognize them. Some of them have spent a lot of time working on this seminar and other efforts, uh, particularly um, I particularly want to thank uh, Chris and Jim and Martha and Alicia in the External Affairs Department for working on this and all others who have been working on it. I also want to introduce, we have a number of board members here present. As you know, the River District uh, has a 15-member board, um, one from each of the uh, counties within the Colorado River uh, Basin uh, drainage area. And I want to introduce them, first of all, uh, and please hold your applause till I get them all introduced, but you would, I would ask you to stand. James Newberry, who represents Grand County. Some of them may not be here or may not yet be here. Uh, Tom Alvey, representing Delta County. John Stavney, representing Eagle County. Dave Merritt from uh, Garfield County. Uh, Bill Trampy from Gunnison. I know Bill had to get back to his ranch. He told me that. Uh, Warner Dewey from Hinsdale County, Lake City. Tom Gray from Moffat County. Uh, Steve Mathis from Montrose County. Andy Mueller from Uray. Uh, John Ely from Pitkin County from Aspen. Kai Turner from Rio Blanco County. Reby Hazard from Sawatch County. Gary Martinez from Summit County. Gary. And um, finally, uh, a gentleman that uh, many of you here in the room uh, know and know well, uh, your own commissioner and the representative from Moffat County, Steve Aquafresca. That's what I say, Mesa County, excuse me. Yeah, big difference between Moffat and Mesa County, <laughs> from Mesa County. And um, so I, I appreciate you all coming to this seminar, and I'm going to turn this over now to Steve, who will have a few other introductions before we begin our first panel. Thank you very much. 
Well, Moffat County is not a bad place. I like Moffat County. I, I'm just not from there. I'm from Mesa County. And uh, I have the privilege of uh, representing Mesa County on the Colorado River District Board of Directors. Uh, prior to my service on the board, uh, Dick Proctor, raise your hand, Dick, uh, served two terms on the board. Uh, the uh, River District has always attracted uh, very uh, engaged people from the water community to provide uh, policy and direction for the River District, and it's a great learning experience to, uh, to be part of that. Um, I want to point out that uh, uh, all the PowerPoints that will be shown today uh, during this seminar will be available on the River District website if they're not already there. Uh, also, today's sessions are being videotaped, and, and those videotapes will be available for viewing on the River District website as well. Uh, we're going to uh, kick right off into the subject matter today uh, and begin talking about the Colorado River Basin Study. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation and the seven states in the Colorado River Compact are studying future water supply scenarios against a backdrop of demand exceeding supply on the Colorado River. And uh, we have two co-presenters to, uh, to start the conversation this morning. And uh, after that, uh, we'll uh, dive into a panel discussion. And I'll, I'll introduce the panelists at that time. But right now, I would like to introduce Carly Jerla and Kay Brothers. Uh, Carly is an operations research analyst for the Bureau of Reclamation's Lower Colorado region in the Boulder Canyon Operations Office and that's Boulder Canyon, Nevada. Uh, however, she is currently on assignment to the University of Colorado's Center for Advanced Decision Support for Water and Environmental Systems in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, so uh, I'm privileged to introduce our first speaker, the lady from two boulders, Carly Jerla. Steve, and um, thanks, Tom, for the introductions. And can you all hear me okay? That must be better. No. no, okay. How about that? All right, so thanks, Steve. Also, thanks, Tom, for the introductions. Um, also, would like to thank the River District for inviting us here to speak today about the study. It um, truly is a great opportunity. Um, it's great to be here in Grand Junction. It's uh, quite beautiful. Um, so thanks to you all. I'm going to go ahead and um, give a pretty broad brushed overview of the basin study um, and I'm going to set up, uh, kind of set the stage and set up the discussion um, to come from the panelists later in the talk. Um, as, as most of you know, um, are probably familiar with the basin study, it has two pretty broad objectives. The first objective is to assess future water supply and demand in the entire Colorado River Basin over the next 50 years, to look at when you start to see an imbalance in between, between supply and demand. I think um, in some cases we're already there. And to see how those imbalances impact the various resources across the Colorado River Basin. Then we go to look at options and strategies or opportunities or portfolios, those things that we may look to resolve some of those imbalances. Over here is a map of the Colorado River Basin. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the lay of the land here, but I do want to point out these adjacent areas to the hydrologic boundaries of the basin. And as many of you know, um, a significant portion of the Colorado River water is exported to areas outside of the hydrologic boundaries of the basin. And so these areas are pretty important, especially when you're considering the future demand um, and that the Colorado River has to meet in the future. The study is being conducted by both Reclamation and the seven basin states, and it's also being done in collaboration with stakeholders throughout the basin. Um, other federal agencies, uh, Native American tribes and communities, conservation organizations, many of these groups, although they're not cost share partners in the study, such as Reclamation in the basin states, they have been putting a significant amount of in-kind services into the study, and um, their their participation and involvement in the study we really feel is paramount to the success of the study. 
The study began in January of 2010 and it's on track to be completed in November of 2012. Um, this is an extension of a couple months, I'm sure a few of you are aware of. And we just really wanted to take some more time to sort through the many different ideas that came into the study in terms of resolving system imbalances and we'll talk a little bit about those later. And also to allow some folks some time to really think about next steps and what comes after the study and how to how to set the study um, findings and considerations to set forth those discussions about next steps. And the last point I'll make here um, is that this is a planning study. So it's, a, it's under the Basin Study Program, which is part of the Department of Interior's Water Smart Initiative. It's not a NEPA document. Um, we're not looking to make a decision to come out of this study. We really view it as laying the technical foundation for which future studies and future discussions and dialogue can start about these important problems and imbalances facing us all in the basin. Um, this figure here shows our historical supply and use in the Colorado River Basin over the last close to 100 years or so. So this is basin-wide, this is measured um, at Imperial, so this um, is really a measure of all the supply and use in the basin. Um, you can probably clearly see or guess which line is which, but the red here is the use been really steadily on the rise um, since 1914. And the blue is our supply, and I don't think this is news to anyone here, but the supply of the Colorado River is highly variable. Um, I think just this year and last year, the hydrology that we saw in this basin is a pretty good indicator of the type of variability we can see and we may see um, under the impacts of projected climate change on this basin. So a couple points to make about this figure. Um, we're looking at annual supply and demand. And we can see here, or excuse me, supply and use. And we can see here that there's been plenty of times in the past where supply has been less than use. <clears throat> and here is a pretty dramatic example um, in the 1977 and then in the recent drought period. But because of the large amount of reservoir storage on the system, we can store over four times the average annual flow on the system. We've been able to manage the resources and meet deliveries almost with 100% reliability, except for some smaller areas in the upper basin that don't have that reservoir storage. What we're really concerned about and what this study is simply put looking to do is to extend these curves out the next 50 years and we're concerned about these long-term trends. Our reservoir storage can get us through periods like this or this, no problem, but if we're seeing a trend towards decline and increasing um, supply and demand or increasing demand, um, we might need to look at some different solutions. This bar here marks where we were 50 years ago, roughly, and it's put here just to think about the type of changes that we've already seen in use and supply over the next, over the last 50 years, and to think broadly about what may happen in terms of this supply and use in the next 50 years. These are the changes that we've seen on this river over the last 50 years. Um, population and land use was increased dramatically. We over doubled the population on the basin in the last 50 years. We also doubled the amount of storage capacity to meet deliveries for that population during that time. Um, I already talked about the changes we saw in the natural system. Over the last 12 years or so, we saw the lowest 10-year average of flow on the Colorado River Basin. Um, and we've also had some pretty extreme changes in terms of institutions and governance, legislation. We had um, NEPA, the Endangered Species Act, the QSA, and most recently the Interim Guidelines to Operate Pal and Mead, signed in um, 2008, 2007, became implemented in 2008. 
I just wanted to note a couple studies that reclamation in the states have been involved in in the past. So studying the basin on this magnitude and looking towards the future in terms of supply and demand imbalances is nothing new. We kind of think of this as a new chapter um, in a long history of doing these types of studies together. Um, in 1971, we had the comprehensive framework studies. And these studies kind of marked a shift in this um, philosophy this philosophy of um, developing our ability to use the resources and a recognition that we now have the ability to fully use the resources and we're looking towards a future of supply and demand imbalance. So there was no quantification of those imbalances do done in this study, but this, these kind of marked um, the recognition in a study of that imbalance. And so the Colorado River Basin Study is really another chapter in this long history moving forward to quantify these um, imbalances and to look towards what to do about them. And one notable finding from this study was the need for augmentation. And if the upper basin and the lower basin were going to um, develop into utilizing their full apportionments under the Colorado River Compact, that there would be a need for augmentation on this system. Okay, so the four major phases of this Colorado River Basin study follow those objectives pretty closely. The first one is called water supply assessment. We assess the water supply over the next 50 years in the basin. In the second phase, water demand assessment, do the same thing but with water demand. We bring them together in phase three, which we call the system reliability analysis, and we look at how those various scenarios of supply and demand play out in terms of the, the reliability of the system. So here we look at the impacts um, to a large number of resources all over the basin um, to see how that reliability effect affects both the nature and the timing and the magnitude and the impacts of those resources. And then in phase four, we start thinking about different options and strategies or opportunities to mitigate and alleviate some of those impacts. Um, I just want to point out here these two um, bubbles here in the middle uh, are denoting a scenario planning approach that this study has taken. And this is really the overarching um, uh, framework for the study. It's, uh, it's an understanding that there are the paths of future supply and demand on the Colorado River system is highly uncertain. Um, and it cannot be represented for it by a single view. So we sought to um, quantify and identify a range of different futures that could represent how supply and demand on this basin may unfold. Um, this concept is illustrated by this figure. Um, it's the cone of uncertainty. Um, here we are today. So there's no uncertainty about where we are today as we move forward. Um, and we can take different pathways. We have disrupted events, decision points. And the, the idea here is to identify a broad range of scenarios um, that's going to span uh, the range of that cone. And then when we look at um, options and strategies, we're looking at different opportunities that are going to perform well no matter where we end up on that cone. And another important point is, is that as we move down the pathway between now and 2060, we're constantly reevaluating where we are and whether those options and strategies that look so good today are still a good idea as we move down um, that cone of uncertainty. So the water supply and water demand scenarios that have been identified in this study, I'll first start with water supply. We have four of them. Um, the first three are titled Observed Resampled, Paleo Resampled, and Paleo Conditioned. These look at, I'll start with the first one, um, this is just resampling your historical record of supply on this basin. So this is your very traditional kind of outdated planning methodology where you just assume that the his history is going to repeat itself. You will see nothing in the future that's different than what you saw in the last 100 years of record on the Colorado River Basin. Um, 
I think we've already seen with the high variability between uh, this year and last year in terms of supply and then having the lowest 10-year um, average over the 100 years that that's probably not the best, that's probably a limited view and not expanding that cone very far if we just stuck to that. So to expand the cone a little bit, we went to the paleo and the tree ring records. So thanks to the great work done at the University of Arizona, we have a pretty long, rich record of what the hydrology on this basin was like back to 1,200 years ago using paleo-reconstructed um, stream flows. So in the, these next two water supply scenarios, we look to those to give us an expanded range in terms of trends and also longer, and also in terms of drought and surplus spells. Uh, what those three scenarios don't give us, though, is what the future supply may look like if a, there is a significant shift in climate. And that's where we, we encapsulate that thinking through the downscaled global climate model projected scenario. So this scenario is taking projections of precipitation and temperature from global climate models. Um, they've been downscaled. Uh, to be specific to the Colorado River Basin. They've been moved through a hydrologic model to give us stream flow. And this scenario really is where we're seeing, we'll look at some results in a minute, but this is really giving us the most uncertainty in, times of, in terms of variabilities and shifts and trends of supply on this basin. Okay, so that's water supply. Water demand, we have six water demand scenarios. Um, these were developed by thinking about those key driving forces the, that impact the way demand grows on this basin. So things like population and water efficiency and agricultural land use. Um, we looked at all of the different ways that those forces could work together, looked at those trajectories and came up with six different demand scenarios. Um, the first one, current projected or a current trends type scenario, this is really um, pulled from uh, the state's current on the books water resources plans. It's sort of a little bit of a business as usual type flavor. Um, to that we add slow growth, so population um, doesn't grow as fast. <clears throat> as we're seeing under that current projected. And coupled with that is an emphasis on economic efficiency. So we're holding our pocketbooks tight. Um, we're not out there spending a lot of money on new technology to use the water more wisely. It's just kind of slow and steady. Um, rapid growth is the other extreme. Population is booming. Um, and then we have two different branches here. What if we adopt technology at a fast pace along with that population growth? What if we adopt it at a low uh, pace with that um, population growth? And then lastly, we have an enhanced environment scenario. <clears throat> and so this scenario is really looking at um, different different levels of growth and what happens if that growth occurs but there's a strong emphasis on environmental awareness and social values and stewardship that's um, coupled with that growing economy. Okay, a quick preview here of some of the results of the water supply scenarios. Um, I apologize if this is probably hard to see in the back, but the blue over here is your business, or sorry, traditional water planning history repeats itself. Over here is climate change. And we're looking at box plots and we're looking at the natural flow at Lee's Ferry. So this is the flow on the basin, or almost all of the flow on the basin, as if humans didn't exist. This is what the flow would be if there were no use, no reservoirs, natural flow. We are looking at box plots of the average flow really over a 50 year period. So if we're looking at our traditional water supply planning, um, history repeats itself type view, we have a pretty small range of what that long term average might look like. And right there in the middle, that's the median of the range and we're, that's right at 15 million acre feet because that's our long term 100 year average on this basin. Um, the bottom line here is that the climate change scenario um, is giving us not only a lower median 
So right here, this is at about 13.6. So this is saying at a, there's, at a median level, um, there is likely to be, under the climate change projected scenario, it's seeing a 9% decline in this long-term average. We're also seeing there's a high level of variability associated with that result. It could be as high as 18 million acre feet. It could be as low as 10 million acre feet. And this spread of this interquartile range is pretty large, meaning um, it's the lowest and also has a lot of variability associated with it. Um, a couple more interesting statistics about these different supply scenarios. We looked at drought, um, we call them deficit and surplus spells. As we all know on this basin, that's pretty um, important. We identified these as two, year, two running meat the two-year running mean, sorry, when you have um, an average below the long-term 15 million. And so what we're seeing is that under, again, that climate change scenario, there's almost double the chance of these pretty long drought spells than there is compared to our history repeats itself type scenario. Also, the history repeats itself has way more surplus conditions, much higher flows and the frequency of that than we're seeing under climate change, less than 1% under climate change. So we, under these scenarios, I think we've expanded the range of that cone pretty well, um, but definitely the climate change scenario is giving us uh, the most variability. Let me shift to water demands. So to quantify the water demand scenarios, we looked to each one of those six scenarios, looked at all of those important driving forces, um, population, ir irrigated acreage, those things, and put numbers to them based on the way the storyline said they were playing out. And here's a plot of those results. So here's historical use. So this is the same use curve we looked at in the beginning of the PowerPoint that had supply on it. And here's the way that that demand is projected to change. Um, this is the highest demand scenario. That's your rapid growth. At the bottom, it's bracketed by your lowest demand scenario, which is the slow growth. There's about a 20% spread between those. These bars under here are representing reservoir evaporation, losses to native vegetation, and our treaty delivery to Mexico, which are extremely important components of our future demand. So if you add in those components and then take the um, demand for in the hydrologic basin and those um, adjacent areas, we're looking at as high as 20.4 million acre feet by 2060 and on the low end about 18.1. Um, this is just to summarize how those parameters are changing. Population is really the driver here. Between that rapid growth and slow growth scenario, you're seeing a change, an increase of population from about 40 million in 2015 up to 77 million, so almost a 90% increase under that rapid growth scenario, or a 23% increase under that slow growth scenario. That is. Population is one thing, but how water use is actually impacted is largely determined by your per capita water use, which those scenarios show a decline in that across all scenarios, and it's ranging from 7 to about 20%. Um, irrigated acreage is on the rise, but not as quickly as um, population and M&I uses are, municipal and industrial uses are. You're starting at about 5.5 million acres um, in 2015 and moving up to um, five and decreasing from 5.2 to 4.6 by uh, 2050. This is when you bring supply and demand together. This is uh, a first look at what this gap, just in terms of supply and demand, may look like. Um, here again are those supply and use curves smoothed out a 10-year running average. And this is the result. This is your large amount of uncertainty associated with that supply. And here's your future demand. If you look at the median of those scenarios, we're looking at about a 3.5 million acre foot imbalance by 2060. 
It's important to note, again, that these imbalances have, have occurred in the past. We've been able to manage them through reservoir storage. And it's also important to understand how that imbalance plays out in terms of the resources. So in this study, we're looking at the resources for all of these categories. Um, water deliveries, electrical power, recreation, ecological, all very important resources. We've identified locations where these resources um, have uh, needs associated with them that we could get at with the model that we're using for this study. We're going to simulate the future over the next 50 years on a monthly time step using those supply and demand scenarios and see how those um, resources are impacted. In November, we asked the public to submit ideas on how to deal with this type of imbalance. And over that time, we received over 150 options. Um, they're roughly grouped in, in, in terms of increased supply, reduced demand, and modify operations, and governance and implementation. The increased supply includes things like importation, reuse, desal, reduced demand is your conservation type options. Roughly split half and half between those two and then some ideas about changing reservoir operations, banking, marketing came in at about 25%. And then some governance, change the law of the river, um, take down the major dams, those pretty thorny issues came in at about 10%. We will organize these and assess all of this different criteria, clearly yield, implementation, feasibility, cost, environmental impacts associated with them are very important pieces. And then really the final piece of this study is to group these things into portfolios, put those portfolios into the future, see how they perform, and then discuss the trade-offs, um, what portfolios perform well in different futures, what options across those portfolios are common across all of those portfolios and perform well, how much do they cost, how reliable they are, how reliable are they, what are they like in terms of impacts. And that really sets up the findings and future considerations for the study. And I thank you very much um, for your time and interest and I'm going to hand it over to Kay. And we'll have an opportunity for questions uh, for the first two speakers as well as the panel during the panel discussion. Um, I also want to point out that uh, there are biographies in our program, but uh, I'd like to mention just a couple words prior to each speaker. And uh, Kay Brothers, our next speaker, is a consultant who formerly served as Deputy General Manager of Engineering and Operations for the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Thanks for being here, Kay. Thank you for uh, inviting me and it's a pleasure to be here. I, I did look at the program and I've been retired for a couple of years and I looked at the picture and said, oh my, maybe, maybe I need to get a new picture. I don't know that it's, retirement has improved my looks that much. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be here with you to talk about uh, the Basin Study. Uh, the seven basin states and the water purveyors, as Carly had said with the Bureau of Reclamation, are actually funding the Basin Study. I want to go into a little bit the cooperation that the, the Bureau of Reclamation and the Seven Basin States have, have had in the past. It's, it's nothing new to try to address water supply problems with cooperation and with regulation. I'd like to talk to a couple of examples that have done a lot for Southern Nevada and a, lo a lot for the Colorado River Basin. Uh, the first example I'd like to talk about is the 1999 off-storage um, uh, water banking regulations. Um, they provided for water banks in the lower basin. And this helped Southern Nevada tremendously to uh, get water for the future. Also, uh, with the help of Arizona, we have over 600,000 acre feet stored in aquifers. We have some water stored in, in uh, California uh, that benefited California and Southern Nevada. So that's a very big success story when we look at uh, meeting needs of the basin and, and future water supplies. Carly mentioned the 2007 interim guidelines um, that uh, provides for designated shortages in the lower basin and also provides for the uh, operations of lakes Powell and Mead. This was a huge milestone for the complete basin. I think you might appreciate that for Nevada to have shortages designated is very important. The shortages, as you probably know, are tied to Lake Mead. That's a very big part of knowledge that you need when you go forward to meet water supply of, of how much you might be shorted. 
Also, the knowledge of how we're going to operate the reservoirs to try to minimize the impacts in each reservoir uh, is very important for, for all the basins. So these regulations set out a framework that we're operating in now and plan to operate well into the future. That's very important for the basin states and the water purveyors. Carly mentioned that the imbalances and, and the resource uh, problems were started to, to surface in 1971. Well, I'd like to uh, reference a 1975 study that the Bureau put out that said that uh, in spite of conservation, without augmentation of the natural flow of the Colorado River, we would see future shortages of around two and a half million acre feet. Well, Carly just showed you an average or a median of what shortages this study is going to put out with all our, our various scenarios, and that was a, a median of three and a half million acre feet. So you can see this is a large problem. It gets larger as we go forward in time. And so something uh, like this study is very well needed to start defining what we're going to do to respond to this uh, problem. Carly said that there are four uh, scenarios as far as hydrology, and she went over those pretty in detail, and six demand scenarios. Now, as a water manager, what we're going to look at, of course, is the worst case. So what is that going to be? Of course, it's going to be the climate change scenario with the rapid growth scenario, and that's going to sh show you the, the greatest imbalance, and that's what we're all going to look at. I'd like to caution you a little bit here that we should be looking at all of it, like you say, because it is such a large average that we need to look at the future is so uncertain that we need to be learning from all of it but of course what we're going to look at is the worst case but in in looking at climate change i think we as the seven basin states think that we do need to do more research in climate change and and we know that uh, it's important to have these models that are, are predicting climate change but it's very important to look at how we downscale these models to a, a, a basin like the colorado river basin so we need to put a lot of, of work into that and, and a lot of work into the future predictions of what is going to happen to the climate. The basin study has a lot of tools that are very um, going to be very good for future assessment. As, as Carly kind of mentioned, what we're looking at is, is trying to look at metrics on the river and, and what uh, happens with the hydrology and the demands. Like uh, for Southern Nevada, a very important metric is when will Lake Mead reach elevation 1,000? Our intakes, of course, go dry if it goes below 1,000. So that's a very important metric to us. So we go out there, we look at the hydrology sequences with the demands, and we see how many times does that metric exceed, or how many times does Lake Mead go below 1,000. That's very concerning. So then what we do is look at the options, put them online as time goes along, and see with those options being put in place what happens and, and, and how many times less does Lake Mead go below a thousand. That's maybe Southern Nevada's eyes, but that's very important. So what this does is give us a very useful tool in evaluating various scenarios and options. And this is so important and I think exciting about the basin study is this is the first step in utilizing these tools. And we'll be continually, I think, in the future, looking at the options, as Carly said, and refining them as the future goes on. It's going to be a tool that's going to be used uh, well into the future. All right, I've got to have a little water to talk about these 150 options a little bit here. And these uh, options were ranging from weather modification to desalination projects to changes in governance or operation of the river. Um, the near term options, of course, the ones that we can implement in the near term are going to be conservation, weather modification, ag to urban transfers, and in fact, these are being implemented now. Um, I know the municipalities have extreme, very, very aggressive conservation programs. Uh, ag to urban transfers are going on. Uh, the states have been funding weather modification activities in the upper basin, so these will continue because we can implement these in the near term. However, as water managers, and, and looking at some of these critical needs out in the future and that imbalance it continues to grow as we go out there. A water manager is, I think, a little more comforted if you have a project that you are knowing that when you flip a switch you can bring in water and a, a certain volume of water. So we're looking at a desalination or an importation project in the very late stages of that planning horizon that needs to be coming online to, I think, give water managers a, a comfort. The problem with that is, is the upfront lead time that is required to bring these projects online. 
And that's why I think as water managers we're looking out there but knowing that we need to be starting very very soon looking at feasibility and funding issues to, to start evaluating uh, desalination and importation projects. Um, because the future as you can see might be quite uh, different than the past. Um, that, I guess, brings me to the section of the options that we uh, saw a lot of uh, options as far as changing the law of the river, changing the governance, or changing the operations of, of, the, of the river. I talked a little bit, a bit about the surety that we have of the 2007 guidelines, and, and water managers and purveyors have been operating, uh, as I said, to address shortages, and those shortages are known. They're designated in those, those uh, guidelines. Uh, the way we operate the river systems and, and the reservoirs are known, and that gives us some surety of, of what will be done to try to minimize the impacts on both of the reservoir systems. This is tremendously important to water managers. And so I would say uh, that talking about changing that or um, revising that gives us a lot of apprehension. And I say we were very, actually would probably be opposed to doing that because we plan so much on having those, those uh, regulations and those guidelines in place. If we would be doing anything, I think uh, the guidelines call for maybe reconsultation when Lake Mead gets to 1025, the elevation 1025. Maybe we need to start discussing what will happen when it, Lake Mead does get to 1025 a little sooner. I think uh, uh, being involved in, in the guidelines of, of what we did before we actually, all the negotiations that we did before we had the 2007 guidelines, it, it, this consensus and this agreement doesn't come overnight. So if we did anything, I, I would hope that we start talking about what we do when we get to 1025 in Lake Mead as one thing. So anyway, I guess to leave you, I'd like to give you, you three things here. That the basin study is like a first step in what I would call a water resource planning activity for all the Colorado River Basin. And, and I think we'll continue to use the tools that, that have been developed and continue to refine our demands and continue to look at the options as we go forward. Second thing I'd like to leave with you is, from a water manager's perspective, the importance of looking at large projects, feasibility of large projects to really try to address that large imbalance that we see way out in the planning horizon. And, and we know because of the timing, we need to start now. And then the lastly, I would say that uh, just governance changes or reoperations, if you're a water purveyor, just kind of make, give you the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> we just can't, can't see that that would be any benefit right now because of the assurance that we have with the guidelines in place and, and the planning that we've done to, to meet shortages and, and to rely on those guidelines being in place. So I thank you.